Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll give everyone a minute to join. And I'll um, start or just put this little slide up as we get started. So everybody can see what they're here for. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm going to let everybody join. Um, hopefully, folks will join over the next like couple of minutes. Um, yeah, if uh, everyone would like to say hello in the chat, um, tell us where you're calling in from, um, wishing everybody a happy International Women's Day. So if you want to say hello um, and type where you're from, that might be really fun for us to see where everybody is uh, joining from. If you're not in New York City, I know we have a pretty big, um, it seems like from the registration group, people from all over. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, James. Yeah, so if you're just joining us, um, I just saw a couple of other people join. Um, Hola, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is <laughs> joining. Yeah, I know we have a big contingent <laughs> from the island. Um, yeah, if you'd like to put in your um, your name, where you're joining us from, that'd be super fun for us to see who all is here. And we'll get started maybe then like just one, one more minute. More Puerto Rico, amazing. I love it. Hey, Brian. It's really nice on a, on International Women's Day to truly have an international group. So that's awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I think we'll get started just for the sake of time. I wanna be mindful for everybody's <laughs> time because it is um, a work day. So we can make sure we get our conversation in before the hour's up. Um, so um, I'm gonna get started. You guys can continue um, popping in your notes in the chat if you'd like to say hello to everyone and get to know where everybody's coming from. Um, but we'll get started. My name is Amaris Gutierrez Ray. I'm the founder of the Women in Coffee Project. And we've been having a really good track record of having a virtual panel event every International Women's Day, which has been really nice. This is sort of the one of the uh, beautiful things that came out of the pandemic that a lot of people were interested in having conversations together virtually and what better time to do it than on International Women's Day. So this conversation came about because we started talking with a group of folks about this really big theme that I don't know if we're gonna be able to unpack completely today, but I think it's a really powerful conversation that has been coming up in a lot of different aspects of the industry, different sectors of the industry when it comes to equity. So the topic is how do education, quality and value intersect? And that will be one of the questions that we um, propose to the panelists here in a little bit. Um, but it's just a really big theme. And I think, you know, especially with um, in the world of equity, talking about educational opportunities is a really big thing that we like to focus on because there's still barriers for people to access them. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well today. But overall, this group of women, the panelists, um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a second, are really amazing educators and have a really powerful perspective on the role that education can play for women and everyone in the industry and sort of start unpacking how this relates to equity and the larger conversation of who defines what, who defines specialty coffee, who defines quality, who defines a lot of the value. And um, since it's a big topic, we're just going to jump right into it. So um, I'd like to ask our panelists if they can introduce themselves to you and share a little bit about their journey. We also um, are trying to do a little bit more work to give visibility into the career paths that women take. Um, women are really experts at creating their own pathways and opportunities, um, and especially with our group of panelists today. So I'm hoping to ask them if they can share a little bit about that as well, how they um, landed in the roles that they have today. So I wanna ask if they can start maybe in the 
order that I see on my screen, and we'll start asking questions if that's okay. So Elvira, you're first on my screen. Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you, because I'm on my phone, so I can't see everyone else, but I'm really, really excited um, to be here with everyone. And um, yeah, I'll get to it. I am originally from Puerto Rico. I grew up on the West Coast. So between um, half of my life, I say, what it was in San Sebastián, other half was in Aguadilla. So I have studied and, uh, you know, born and raised there. And it's been absolutely great because being from San Sebastián, there's a lot of focus on the coffee uh, uh, producing areas uh, around there and then uh, you get a lot of you know from there you move a little bit into Aguadilla and you get more of those coffee shops you know hitting the markets and using the coffee from areas around San Sebastián and uh, for me so I grew up around it my my grand my grandma um, grew up on a coffee farm her parents uh, had a coffee farm and then after that on my grandpa's side uh, his brother, uh, so my great uncle, had uh, collected artifacts from uh, coffee farms. And if you go to San Sebastian, you'll find the coffee museum and you'll get to see uh, all of, or a small amount uh, of what uh, he collected. But it's it shows the trajectory of, you know, from producing to roasting to uh, almost packing in the history of coffee in Puerto Rico, uh, more specifically in that area. So, uh, but it wasn't until about 2014 that I started uh, really getting into coffee. I went to the Coffee and Chocolate Expo um, over on the area of San Juan, and that really opened my eyes to everything that is not just the producing side, but also uh, the, the service industry itself and uh, the education aspect of it. And that was really exciting. I took a class, I was blown away, and I got to meet a lot of you know, very well-known people in the coffee industry then, um, for example, Nicole Rosario being one of them. And it was just very, uh, I was in awe and amazed as, uh, of all the opportunities that can exist in the industry. And so I, I went on and pursued my uh, barista level one certification, uh, but found myself a little bit, um, like I couldn't get further than that um, where I was. So 2015, I moved up to the States and it wasn't actually till 2016 that I was living in California that I started uh, looking further into education and there was a lot to offer in California or at least in the whole area. And so I um, went on to do my a second level of barista because there it used it was still SCAA so um, it hadn't merged yet so I went and did barista level two I did the instructor development course in San Rafael as well because I wanted to I've always found that whatever I've learned and whatever I know I want to share it with others and so I wanted to share my knowledge and help others build themselves up to be successful and um, hopefully within that try to minimize um, any sort of barriers that come their way and so I we just found like how can I make this as accessible to to people and so um, eventually I went on and um, I got my once in there the SCA merged into well the SCA and the SCA merged into what is the SCA, and um, I was able to complete my courses to become an authorized SCA trainer in the barista course, and uh, that was really, really great. Um, it brought a lot of opportunity as well to be a station instructor at the um, SCA Expo and get to meet and help uh, a whole lot of people and as a volunteer, which was a great opportunity all in itself. So um, I helped at lectures and I also helped at uh, the when they offered the actual barista courses uh, in person at Expo to a mass amount of people. Um, and from there was able to participate in um, giving lecture different, um, not lectures, but um, short 
uh, classes specific to one thing, like I specified on alternative milks, which was really great. Um, and that was uh, very exciting and a lot of people uh, really enjoyed it. And, uh, and I've gone from there and trying to see how to help people. Now, in all of this, I think about 2020, the pandemic comes. And um, with that, I decide as things slow down and it's harder to hit the, um, you know, travel to places and give courses, I decided to pursue my master's in agribusiness. And so I've, I slow down on, our, on giving classes but uh, I don't slow down on um, finding ways to help people and making the education accessible. So between being able to offer courses virtually and help helping people navigate um, their careers or where they want to go in coffee on the virtual aspect, and then um, through some of my research papers uh, from the university, trying to reach out to the the producers in Puerto Rico as well and seeing where are the, their biggest needs and what are some barriers and how can you know hopefully at some point um, we can come together to make it accessible and learn more about that and fast forward we're in 2023 so I finished my master's now in December 2022 um, and I hope to really get back into the the realm of just continuing to help and finding ways to uh, reach the producer side uh, as well as helping uh, baristas or newer and you know veteran folks in the coffee industry on the service end. Awesome, thank you. Um, Maria Esther, would you like to go next and introduce yourself? Yes. Well, uh, thank you everybody for being here. I'm so happy to see not only women on this uh, platform and this platform, but seeing men too. So thank you for being here because this is relevant to everybody. Um, happy International Women's Day, by the way. So I'm a lawyer. I am from Venezuela and I am living here in Miami in the United States. Um, I'm a lawyer. Not any of my family is in the coffee industry or are producers or anything. So I started my journey like something personal for political reasons that I won't uh, bring to this conversation, but uh, it was just a hobby. I started in 2002. There was not too much information, mostly was online or things that were happening and in the international coffee uh, platform, but I was in love with coffee. It was just a personal journey. I think that everything that is a studying or a studies or whatever you're doing to research and to grow is good. So I started with this and I was the first trainer for Specialty Coffee Association of Europe, that is SCAE and SCAA. They were separate, as Elvira said. Um, I started giving classes in 2011. I am a karate, a karate person. I'm a black belt. I, I, I love doing exercises. And yeah, this is me. So I'm a lawyer, broke to coffee. And thanks, God, for that. <laughs> and now an educator. <laughs> um, okay, Nicole, would you like to uh, round us out and introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity of inviting me to be here with this amazing woman uh, panels. Uh, I would like to um, uh, be thankful uh, and appreciate uh, everyone that is here today. Uh, basically, I am from Puerto Rico. I grew up in Ponce, uh, but move up to the north. Uh, to study a master's degree in organizational psychology and a minor in human resource. Uh, and in the way I fell in love with coffee because coffee was my job, the one that um, gave me the money to be able to keep on studying. Still, I fell in love with the process. And since uh, 2006 or seven, I've been in the coffee industry. I worked uh, as a barista, as an assistant to coffee instructors, uh, as an instructor, 
And, and on 2019, uh, me and my partner, Xavier Matos, uh, we open up a parchment sport company that it's a corporation that is responsible for uh, the our pro main project, Dueto, that it's uh, in the oven. <laughs> And uh, we develop origin uh, together. So here we are. Amazing, thank you. Yes. So I thought maybe the best way to start would be just to talk in general about, before we start talking about um, what's happening or this intersection or um, what the obstacles are, I thought maybe we could start on a really positive note. Um, and Maria said, you're so good at, at that. And this is sort of the question that I framed for you based on a conversation we had earlier because you're so passionate about this. But I thought maybe you could start us off by sharing from your perspective, what you think the benefits are to education and what women or other folks can gain from pursuing educational opportunities in general. Yeah, thank you for that question. I you know, I think that we human beings are, uh, are in our nature is the, we have this inside of evolve. Every one of us in different aspects can be personally, can be emotionally, can be physical, but we need to evolve. It's in our nature, in our DNA. Um, I have been a teacher for my whole life. I was a uh, uh, aerobics teacher when I was 17, 16, 17 years old. Then I was a law teacher when I was, in, uh, because I have three masters in law. So I was teaching at the university as well in Venezuela. Then I started being a teacher in coffee in 2011. I'm a roaster, I buy coffee. It's not just that I educate. We have a, a company here in the United States, Coffee School and Miami Coffee, and we have been buying coffee since 2015. And roasting coffee is one of the parts that I love the most, and being involved with uh, quality. And especially, I know that this is something that everybody's talking about. Oh, let's talk about producers. Oh, let's take the picture on the farm. Oh, let's let's be trending. Let's say that we want sustainability or or sustainability. Let's talk about these things. Um, but at the end, you are not doing so much. So you are just bringing those words into the conversation to market your business. And I think that that's really dishonest. So when you teach people, you have the time to, or when you just, let's not talk about teaching, but when you talk to somebody and you listen with intention, you understand what is happening around you understand what are the problems that we are struggling with the producer but not only the producers the roasters the coffee shop owners the chipping everything is affecting right now what you want to do so the only way that you can be involved is learning that's the only way there is not another one so i think that education is not only to pay for a certificate or to get a certificate or a certification is is everything we are talking today and we're going to learn from each other we are um, attending a class that maybe doesn't have a certificate but it's a workshop or is something free or is something that you pay but you are learning if you have the intention to do it. So I think that education is, is one of the most important tools that we have. And I think, and I do believe truly that many of the problems that we are having right now is lacking of education. It's not because we don't want to, it's because we don't know how to. So that's the, the one of the most important things that I believe that we can do is, is talking about education is, giving the opportunity to others to access that education, but I cannot provide any access to anybody if I am not successful. If I don't grow in my business, I can't help anybody, right? I need to try to put my business house to grow and to do the things in the right way, in an honest way, in a legal way, and then I can help others. We can uh, try to, when I start on this, I met a woman that she was the director of education for an SAE. I met her in 2010 in Portland. And she didn't know me and I didn't know her. And she gave me a reason to be on in this industry. 
And I am here and I am doing what I do thanks to her because she gave me a hand in a moment that I was needing that. Coffee changed my life and my daughter's life. And it's, I am so grateful to Coffee. And I never look back. In 2014, I quit my job as a lawyer and I never came back to that. And I don't want to come back again. And this is because of the incredible teachers that taught me about coffee. So yes, I do believe in education and I don't believe that is, I never took the education as a, oh, I have this certificate. Oh, I have this barista or I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna help this or that because I didn't know the industry. But with time, I learned to how I can help all these people that is involved and at the same time help myself because I am no Mother Teresa of Calcutta that I'm gonna live just because of the air. I want to be successful too. The more that I know, the more that I can do. Amazing. So it sounds like you're also saying too, there's like a level of enrichment that it's not that you were lacking something that you were like less than that you need education to like uh, improve you. It's sort of also like, it's sort of an enrichment. You grow and evolve. I love that word that you use, evolve. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing. Yes, it is powerful and you feel super empowered and you met amazing people, like all the people that is today here, like you, like Nicole, Elvira, all of us. And it's just thanks to coffee. In other words, I will never meet any of you because I will be on my desk working as a lawyer and I will be losing all of these opportunities. Totally. I agree with you completely. Okay, I think um, I'm gonna move to our just um, our heads here on Zoom. Um, and then um, I'm gonna ask if um, in the sake of time, maybe we can um, just continue going through our questions for our sort of structured conversation so we can get to the time where we can invite folks in. So I'm gonna move on to the next question if that's all right. I thought, um, you know, now that we sort of have talked a little bit about the positive aspects of education and the benefits Maybe we can um, move to Nicole and ask you, because you have this uh, really amazing perspective working as an educator in a country that produces coffee. If you could share a little bit about what you think from what you see are some of the obstacles for women or other producers to um, access some of these educational opportunities. Like what stands in the way of people pursuing more educational opportunities? Yes. Um... Well, I'm, I'm going to speak towards my experience, right? Um, I started out as a barista uh, way before I, I was an educator. And for me, I, I think people in Puerto Rico can relate to this. Uh, for me, it was very, very, very difficult to be able to educate myself just because as a barista, I gained so little. Like uh, we start with minimum wage. We, we are paid by the hour. If you're lucky enough, you can get uh, up to $12 an hour, maybe with tips. <laughs> so basically to me, uh, a main obstacle is uh, people not uh, seeing the career as, uh, as formal as it can be. So that was my main obstacle. I had uh, to uh, pay for my family, be able to you know support and sustain myself and to be able to do all of that. And at the same time, uh, reach out uh, or, or pay a program for to be able to educate myself. It was really hard. Uh, and that was for me that I was in the city, you know, with the, 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 the tools uh, surrounding uh, that helped me. I cannot imagine uh, how difficult could that be uh, for women producers or for producers in general. Uh, I admire a lot. And when I see, uh, for example, I, I, I have the opportunity to talk to Ruth, uh, Ma, eh, Marie, eh, Ruth and Alejandra that are uh, producers uh, here in the island. And I see them with the drive and the motivation and the willingness to, you know, get things done. And they don't know if they're doing it right, but they don't give up and they are willing to give all of the what they have uh, just to get self-educated. For me, then I make a stop and I say, you know, this is not a, an obstacle for me. There's uh, worse scenarios. We just have to listen 
We have to be empathic with uh, one another and be able to bring solutions uh, to, the, to the table. Uh, and one of my biggest motivations, and I think Maria Esther, uh, maybe she can uh, tell us later on more about that. It's her story. Uh, she was telling me about how in Venezuela, you only get to spend uh, a certain amount of money in things and you don't have a way of uh, have, uh, being able to have money to even think about education. Uh, so that for me was a huge impact uh, when it came to making a difference because I, I think uh, after, uh, before being an, 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 a coffee instructor, I was thinking a lot about the difficulties and the obstacles and I was only living on that like, Oh my God, it's it's a struggle. It's so it's it's hard to get educated. It, it's hard to get well paid. It's hard to, but then I hear all these women and my mentality started to change. And we start to you know uh, working together and developing projects and developing uh, different things to be able to make it uh, sustainable. Sustainable, and still we have a lot of work uh, to do. But I think uh, that uh, in the path, uh, all of these projects and all of these uh, uh, people that are interested in developing and in helping, I think in the in the union is going to be uh, a greater progress, and we're going to see evolution. Like uh, I started out as a, as a barista, uh, paid in as a minimum wage, and as is as it for for now. Right now, uh, I'm, uh, I have this amazing job opportunity in the South. I'm, I'm, I'm an instructor as an, an academy, an a coffee academy in Ponce eh, called Academia de Baristas. And I have my, you know, I have my, uh, tengo mi sueldo y tengo, you know, I, I have what I want. Uh, so, and, and, and I'm looking forward uh, to keep uh, through education, uh, exposing myself. So I can, uh, you know, keep on developing and do my own projects as, as well, because that's the other thing. Uh, another obstacle is that, that uh, maybe you have, you're in the right place, but maybe you have to give certain exclus exclusivity to that uh, person that it's uh, giving you the job. Uh, but we lack uh, on, on the empathic of knowing that people are able to be extraordinary on, a job basis, but they can still do their projects. They can still, uh, you know, develop themselves in their career. So yes, I think uh, as a coffee community, we can do beautiful things and we can only see obstacles like uh, opportunities to develop other things. I love that. I love that mentality. It also seems like there's, there's like enough of a range of obstacles that are like there's like real like costs and then there's like um sort of like um precedents like you know people seeing that it's an option to pursue in general and then uh people wanting to have that like understanding the value of it and pursuing it there's just so much stuff so I love how you spin it to feel like <laughs> there's the, the positive energy like that's the thing to focus on the yeah. what it can give you yeah and seeing the obstacles and opportunity is awesome yeah um well, I wanted to see if um, you know any of the other two panelists wanted to make a comment here on either the obstacles or the benefits from education before we move on to the next sort of segment of our structured conversation before Q and A. What do you guys yeah. think? Yeah, I, I will say that you create your own obstacles. That's we will always have obstacles in whatever we do in whatever path that we're doing always maybe it's morning maybe it's because we don't have a specific a tool that we need or maybe because we don't have the money we don't have the education whatever but again i think that you know this thing that people say that you can do whatever you have in your mind to do is true so Obstacles are just in the moment, maybe you can stop, you can breathe again, and you have to continue. That's it. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I agree with what Maria just said, um, because I uh, found myself with several obstacles in the way. And, you know, the way that I saw it was you know, if you want to be an obstacle in my way, I'm just going to find a way to work around it. 
and uh, you know at times would have people say like you know I would have people come to me and say like how have you made it this far you know if I am so and so and you're just you you know trying to make it in the industry I said because I'm trying to make it and because I found myself unfortunately having to work twice as hard as you to get to where I am but here I am because like like Maria was saying you know it's not about just having the certificates and having a wall plastered with you know all these certificates or medals and stuff it's the the underlying that the foundation of I want to learn because I want to help. I want to help myself. I want to help others. And I'm not here to just, you know, have a bunch of accolades. Sure, they're great. But if you, if you're not giving to your community, if you're not helping others, um, if you're not being, you know, of that service, because we work in the service industry, then, you know, what is, what are your the your the real intentions in uh, uh, you know for for those those positions and um yeah i think those those obstacles those barriers will happen but if you find those people that are there to support you and lift you up because they do exist those obstacles and those barriers will we can definitely crush them i've crushed a few and i found that there are just really good people out there that will and are willing to help you and help you grow and lift you up. So yeah, it is, it is a wonderful uh, community, not perfect, but it definitely is wonderful and it has a lot of good stuff to it. Yeah. No, I agree. And this call is a good example of a lot of folks, even here, you know, that we don't know each other or work together you know, really intimately, but everyone here is to support each other's educational path. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe we could switch to this um, bigger question, which I know is a big one. I posed it to you guys um, to be able to start unpacking this a little bit about where we see the intersection of education and value and then bringing quality into the picture. Cause I know this is something that people talk about a lot um, that, you know, maybe education, the only purpose it serves is to give people tools to better understand or describe the quality of coffee. And, you know, we've spent time talking already about how that's not, you know, that's not the whole of it. So maybe Elvira, I could ask you to start beginning to unpack this a little bit. You also have a really uh, powerful story. I wonder if you might be interested in sharing about um, just like language and access to education in the um issues that we have about teaching in multiple languages just to sort of see like um you know some of this stuff about the purpose of education and um who is it for you know that kind of thing um maybe you could start us off yeah um i'll start with um i'll start with well, well um one of the times that i went to the sca expo i was a, the station instructor and you know, this, these expos are for, for everyone and anyone that can join from all around the, the world. And um, it was very, very interesting because you would think that given that there are so many people that are going to come in from all types of um, backgrounds and languages that you would have that, you know, the accessibility aspect of it already, you know, set up. But it was very interesting because in where I was in the room and we were doing the barista uh, level one module and it turned out that I was the only one um, that sorry um, I was the only one that uh, would or could speak Spanish and uh, about a little about half of the attendants there only spoke Spanish or preferred the exams to be in Spanish. And, uh, you know, it just showed that they weren't prepared. And they said, hey, can you stay on? Um, can you stay on much longer to finish their exams? And I said, I have no problem with that. And that was a big uh, a moment of awakening of realizing that, you know, where where are we going with this and for whom are these 
um, certifications because if we're not making it available to anyone or, or sorry to everyone or accessible to everyone then maybe it's important to look back and readdress that and this is this isn't only with people who are you know wanting to be uh, baristas but at times too um working in a specialty coffee shop in in California you know, I got an opportunity to talk to different producers um, and, you know, networking is a big aspect as to why they become really involved with um, organizations like the SCA and, uh, and other organizations as that um, <laughs> because they want to reach certain markets, um, but reaching certain markets means things cost a lot more, you know, money is a big factor to that or, you know, we have different certifications that come, or there exist different certifications that come with um, green coffee, you know, like the fair trade and um, organic and those things, which are really good and really important. But there are producers that would say, you know, I do, I'm very, very clean in my process and I do everything right, but I do not have the money to spend on a certification like that. And, um, and that's an obstacle that they have in their way on, you know, at origin. And then it's looking for ways of, you know, roasters that are, you know, are understand that, that, you know, the coffee is, is produced and worked in, uh, in a way of as close to organic as possible, but cost wise you know can't afford the certification are you willing to um you know still buy this coffee and help you know help the the farmers at origin um and that was a big thing because those are are obstacles that do happen or also there's there's there are big hits on to you know when coffee tastes a certain way and is so exotic in this way or that way you know that's phenomenal but are you also limiting I'm sorry are you also limiting um opportunities that other coffees that are you know of great quality but unfortunately you know they're different varietals or such don't have those exotic flavors but people go go on this bandwagon of I only want this and this and this and this and I've learned that along the way too, that, you know, all coffee is great in its own unique way. And, um, and it's important to, to bring value to that and highlight that as well. Um, because, you know, we're looking to help the producers um, and, you know, everything is a business. So it's also about um, helping, you know, the coffee roasters or the coffee shops and um, finding a balance between everything. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and yeah, so there's a there's a lot to unpack there. But I, I do want to um open up to everyone else too to um bring their points of view. Yeah. Yeah, Nicole, uh, Maria Esther, what do you think about this? Yes, I, I, I would like to say something here because the, I think that she she says something that is that is really important. Uh, you know there is a there is a coffee for every market and there is a market for every coffee. I do believe in that. Um, I think that this problem about these exotic coffees that she's talking or this incredible process and all of these new uh, cultivars that are out there and that are amazing uh, is really good. But I think that we need to separate this. One thing is that there is a market for every coffee. And one thing is that we can put all these coffees in every market. I, I think that uh, is our, who is, who is demanding the certification from the producers? Who is asking a producer, listen, do you have fair trade? Do you have organic? Do you have a shade ground or this or that? Do you have this, this process and this way? You have uh, an SEA certification because sometimes people come to me and say, but is this coffee SEA? It's the SEA don't certify, doesn't certify coffee. SEA certified people, no coffee. 
So there is all this misunderstanding around who is demanding that? People. Who is demanding that? Baristas. Who is demanding that? Roasters. Those are the ones demanding that. So mm -hmm. who, how this conversation has to change? If I go to you and you have the certification, good for you. Your coffee is really nice and I love it. But if I go to you and you don't have the certification, but your coffee is beautiful, amazing. It has the best pro process in the middle, good for you too. So we are the ones that have to change the conversation. We are the ones who have to explain people, you don't need an organic certification in order for have an organic coffee. And that's why it's so important, all these uh, new classes and all this new uh, information that Coffee Quality Institute is putting out there because it's telling people how to do incredible process without have to you know, go and ask for an organic certification. And I'm not saying that you can or you should not get organic. If you have the money, go for it because there is a huge market out there asking for that. But if you don't have it, we, the people that buy coffee, the people that offer coffee, we are the ones who have to explain people why this coffee is beautiful, why this coffee is clean. And we have to be honest in what we are doing. The problem is that there are a lot of people with no information at all or no education at all trying to be roasters, trying to buy coffee, approaching producers and asking for things that the producer doesn't even know. So that's why education is important because when we talk and we know what we are talking about, we are not going to start asking producers things that they don't have to have. Like, do you have fair trade? Why do they want fair trade? If you have it, good, but I, I, in all my years buying coffee, I have never ever asked a producer, do you have this certification? Because when I receive the sample, I'm gonna grade the sample because I know how to do it. I'm gonna sample roasting the coffee. I'm gonna cup the coffee because I know how to do it. And then I'm gonna ask for the price of the coffee and I'm gonna buy it. But I need to learn how to do all of this. Today, everybody wants to be roasters. Everybody wants to buy coffee. Everybody wants to do everything without the knowledge. And there are amazing, incredible people developing programs in order for us to grow and to be better. So yes, there is a market for certification, but there is a market for Nespresso and for Ely and for these exotic coffees that I cannot offer to my clients because I cannot bring a coffee that is $200 the pound in green for a coffee shop that is selling cortados. So we need to know what is our market? Where are we gonna work? Who is the person that I am buying the coffee for? And explain to them that it's so good an 80 coffee as a 92, but we need to learn. That's when education comes into the into the equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I I think um uh I think what Maria Estel uh, is saying it's it's super accurate as well as Elvira. Um, whenever we went to uh, to origin um uh, in Yauco, uh, I saw a huge limitation uh, that uh, coffee producers here in Puerto Rico have because of uh, the laws and regulations about not being able to export or uh, import uh, coffee if it's not uh, semi-tostado, or I don't know what's the English term semi -roasted. for that. Semi-roasted. Yeah. Semi-roasted. Um, uh, and also uh, that limitations uh, uh, give the government the power to uh, decide uh, what type of variety comes into the island and can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, can be uh, in the farms. Uh, so uh, seeing it uh, in this perspective, uh, we have to be very caref careful with the approach we make to each producer because we don't know uh, the limitations that every origin has with the pro within the process. 
Uh, for us, it's super difficult. Like uh, Project Origin uh, help, helped a lot of us acknowledge uh, the hard work that uh, through education that uh, was being held in the, in the farms with the harvest process, with the lack of, 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 of people to, to go pick. Uh, it was so much more than certifications. So yes, I'm in that line. And I, I think we have to be super respectful. And we have to, uh, when we uh, ask for certifications, we have to know that uh, there's a lot of limitations uh, occurring right now. And, you know, provide solutions. Not, not, no, no exijamos tanto, porque la, the reality of the thing is that uh, there's a lot of people working a lot uh, to be able to bring a good cup of quality coffee to your hands. And that has to be acknowledged. Yeah. For sure. This is something also that I know you were passionate about when we were speaking um, earlier about how the part of the education too is that consumers um, don't always, even if they know a little, maybe they don't understand the full context of like everything that really goes in to the coffee that they drink. And that is something that I think you guys too in your roles can see so clearly because mm -hmm. you have this um, perspective that spans both, you know, the cultural fluency to understand countries that produce coffee and also the industry that we live in that specialty now where a lot of us don't have that um, kind of more intimate knowledge of what that looks like. Um, so maybe we're about to go into our section where we invite some questions from the people who are on the call. So I'll say maybe um, everyone, if you have a question and you're starting to think about it and you'll start thinking about it, or you can pop it into the chat, but really quick, maybe we could do a lightning round. I know we didn't, we didn't plan this for this organized yeah. conversation, but I thought maybe each of you could give just like one minute of advice on how people can educate their customers or the people that they interact with about the value of coffee. Mm -hmm. Maybe like a real quick anecdote or thought, if that's okay, before we get to the question and answer section. Is that okay? Yeah. Nicole, would you like to start since you just finished? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, um, I think uh, we as baristas uh, have a major responsibility in our hands of not only serving a good experience and cup of coffee, but to uh, make sure that the client uh, gets uh, the knowledge uh, of the process being held uh, behind that cup. Uh, not only with that, we have the responsibility on uh, creating the cup because we have to, you know, uh, be careful with the process because if not, it se puede echar a perder. Uh, but, st but still, uh, I think that uh, a major responsibility, it's making sure that that client uh, can appreciate not only uh, sensory wise, uh, the cup of coffee that it's being handed to them, but to know what's behind that, uh, you know, make the connection, uh, talking about the, 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 the process, the, the, the farmer, the producer, the harvest, make any type of connection. And I think I have done it and it has worked. And uh, people uh, have started developing uh, this uh, connection towards the industry and towards the coffee and, and engaging and emerging with the process just because you talk passionate about it. So I think we have the responsibility uh, as baristas and has, uh, as uh, instructor, instructors to be able to transmit that through uh, the experience and the cup of coffee that we're serving. Maria Esther or Elvira, what do you think? Yeah, I, I will say that this is a question that is all the time popping on my mind. How can we educate people? How can we do this? And, and I think that it depends of where you are on this industry. If you are a roaster, if you are a buyer, if you are a coffee shop, it's, it's going to change totally the, the approach. But I do think that first we need to be respectful of the needs of this person because not everybody wants to be educated and that's good too. So 
I need to be empathetic to realize who is this person that is coming to me. Okay, do you can I be talking to you about this farming 16 meters above sea level with this process? Maybe you don't want to, so that's good too. And that way of respecting the person is a way of education too. And um, who is the person that wants to come and wants to engage with me and asking, oh, what coffee do you have today? Oh, I came yesterday and I tried this or that. Uh, so that's the person to talk to and try to, you know, start talking about what we're doing, how we're doing. But I think that the best way is what I call the neurogastron sensory neurogastronomy. It means that I have to provide the best experience, not only the coffee, is since the moment that the person get into the coffee shop or into the roastery even, is everything clean, the music is good, the person are clean, they are friendly, they are smiling, they feel super good. That's the way of educate. Not, not, don't focus just in the cup, don't focus just in the machine or in the place or focusing everything since the person get into, even how easy it is to pay, that's even a way of educating. So yeah, that's what I, I always taught my baristas when we have the coffee shop, just pay attention to who the person is and try to read that person because we need to respect what everybody wants. And that's the way they're gonna keep coming. And at some point they're gonna ask something, that's the moment to talk to them and to teach them and you know, to explain who we are and what we want to do. That's what I think. Love it. Elvira? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, really quick, I agree. I think that everything um, both Nicole and Maria have said is, is yes, all of that. And I would even add that like um, going off of what Maria, like not everyone wants to be educated and that's completely fine. And they, some people just want to get their cup of coffee and go perfect other people do want to chat I think giving them just a little bit a tidbit whether it's oh I'm tasting these notes in my coffee in the coffee today or I use this coffee today uh, let me know what you think next time you come back or something like that but also if you find that you can um, reach uh, you know people in groups or a little bit of at a time maybe offering some sort of uh, some classes to taste different coffees or um you know, different things, be it just theory or something more practical. And I think that really will bring people in to want to, without scaring them, um, will bring people in to want to know more about coffee. And you get these one-on-one -on -one experiences to be able to talk more in depth and answer all these questions that they have. So I think uh, additional classes that, you know, doesn't have to be an SCA certified this or that class, but something very simple um, for your everyday person that just is a fan of coffee, wants to know more and is looking to know more. And yeah, they're just, you know, fans, but maybe don't work in the industry, but they have a big respect to it. So doing some small, small classes are always great. For sure. More something accessible to their customer experience. I love that. Um, so uh, it's time for question and answer time. Um, I was going to suggest to you, I forgot to mention to the group that you're welcome to ask a question in English or in Espanol. If anyone has uh, a desire, to, um, all of our panelists here can answer that. So um, we do have two questions in the chat already. So maybe I can start with there. Um, Shannon asks that um, she'll be in Puerto Rico this weekend and would like to visit a coffee farm. Nicole, maybe you can help answer this one. Do you recommend one or an Yeah, option? definitely. I I, uh, I would recommend Gustavo's farm. Uh, it's called Fincha, uh, Finca Rancho Contento. Uh, it's in Yauco, Puerto Rico. Uh, although uh, you have to contact him uh, uh, to to be to see his agenda, to see if he's full or not. But I'm uh, more than uh, willing to give you uh, his. Uh, contact so you can reach out and maybe see the possibilities of go going and and visiting awesome um so uh one other question um from marina i say a question for the panelists from a barista educator producer in new york and, and puerto rico what have you done specifically to make coffee education really and truly more accessible to your communities 
Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to start in my ahead. case. What, what I did is that I, I traveled a lot in 2000, when I started in 2011, you know, many people in Latin America were talking about specialty coffee. They didn't even know what, what was that. Um, but they, do, they didn't know about Nova Simonelli. And so they knew about machines and these kind of things, but they didn't know anything about the specialty. Uh, what I did is that I used to travel uh, without charging for the courses. What I did is that I was given the class, but they needed to pay for the certificate and they needed to pay for my hosted, my all my, uh, let's say, traveling or uh, maybe the hotel. We are talking that it was 2011, so tickets were not so expensive like they are right now in these years, but before, so they pay and sometimes I have 16 people in a class and it was really good for everybody because it was like, you know, uh, at the moment for them to just pay for the certificate in that time. Um, I did it recently in Puerto Rico. We charge like almost nothing. We cover the certification and, and we provide a lot of things for people to like, uh, they can cool camp on the farm. We provide lunch, we provide breakfast, we provide everything. So they felt really good. So that's, that's the thing, but I need to say this. I did it, but I lost money because if you want to give sensory classes or green coffee classes, you need to fulfill the program. So it means that you need to bring coffees, you need to bring solutions, you need to use flavor active. So there is a lot of equipment and things that you need to use to really do the class in the right way. And you cannot do that for free. You need to pay for those things. So, you know, you cannot, right now I, I see this that people are, uh, trying to get everything for cheap or cheaper. And this happens even with our clients. You have these clients that they want to have a specialty coffee, but they come to you and they say, listen, but I want the coffee cheaper. Can you buy cheaper coffee? And do you want to have a specialty coffee? Because the specialty coffee is not cheaper. And there, there are a lot of issues. Not only what producers are facing is chipping, and the chipping is right now a huge problem for all the ones that we are buying. That all the us that we are buying coffee. So, uh, I will say that how can you do education more accessible? Well, put a group together, try to do it the easier for them, try to not be like spending a lot of money like in hotels or accommodations or food even and charge a price that covers the products that you need to use for the class and the certificate and that's the way of helping everybody to have more access to the classes that's what i believe that i did that and it worked for a lot of people many of the people that i taught around the world they are trainers right now and they have, you know, grow and now they have coffee shops. So I know that that works. I know because I did it and, and it worked for many people. Mm -hmm. Didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Nicole, did you have an, were you? Were you yeah, to... on the same line as Maria uh, in, in my path, uh, I, I have uh, uh, my coffee shop, it's in uh, development right now. It's not even open. Uh, still, uh, um, myself and Xavier, uh, whenever we got back from the sensory course we took with Maria, we uh, thought about uh, the lacking of education towards the whole community. And we decided to develop this uh, project uh, without thinking that uh, uh, we used to have uh, the priority, teníamos como prioridad a dueto, pero lo dejamos un lado, and then we we told ourselves, let's just uh, give something back to the community uh, that we need it, you know? So we uh, spoke to Maria, and uh, Maria, everything that she just said, um, uh, it was a talk, uh, we talked about it, and uh, we made it happen 
You know, I, I think that you just need a group of uh, compromised people and passionate people uh, to uh, and, you know, people that are willing to to give uh, to to, you know, uh, to the community something else than uh, just um, uh, to get out of it, you know. So I think uh, the development of these kind of projects are crucial. They're crucial to our uh, community. I think it, it, it not only made an impact on, on, on giving uh, 2021 certifications, but it was like the work developed uh, that came uh, that came after that, like uh, people were were uh, going up to the mountains to help the on the harvest process. Uh, we did so much. Uh, we we generated connections. Uh, people started uh, 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 talking about cupping sections, uh, the importance on of, of trying your coffee, of educating about the process. There there were a lot of bad process uh, that were done uh, during the harvest uh, season. And the education help us understand uh, where, donde estábamos and, and y hacia donde queríamos ir. Uh, so I think uh, being able to have an idea and developing it and ponerla en práctica sin importar eh, cuántos recursos hayan, cuánto dinero se va a gastar. Yo creo que eso es una forma bien bonita de agradecerle a la industria y darle algo a la industria. Uh, and I think we all gain from the process. So, so yes, to me, I was super honored uh, to be uh, have been able to be a part of a project like that. And I hope, uh, yo espero que ideas como esa o ideas mayores y grandiosas eh, ocurran eh, eh, para apoyar a, a la comunidad cafetalera. Que... And I just want to add something, and excuse Elvira before you talk, but... Is is just it was not just a green coffee class. Because of that class, people that didn't even attend the class, they are coming to the farm and they are helping this producer to harvest. And mm. he has been harvesting more than ever. He said he wrote to me in this day and said, I don't have words how to thank you for what you did. Because people that never didn't even knew who he was, are coming voluntarily to the farm with Savi and Nicole to pick the coffee that he was losing because it was ready to be picked and he didn't have the resources to pick the coffee. Elvira, did you, were you, um, I, I don't know if you were about to say something. Oh, no, all good. I know we're short on time and I'd like that we can um, do the, the the last question. But oops, there goes my chat again. Um, the same thing uh, is, yes, I have also offered classes where I have made little to nothing, um, but for the benefit of the students so that they could further on their careers and education. And I thought that that was really key. Um, and offering uh, hybrid models of education and classes has been incredible and really helpful, especially when you have people that maybe can't make it um, out for X amount of days or, you know, um, or a virtual class works out. And it was a very, to do introduction to coffee, for example, virtually was very fun, slight challenge, but very doable. And, you know, we can, if we set ourselves to do things, we can really do it. Like Nicole um, and Maria was saying, you know, you can really, and that's, uh, you can really do what you set, set yourself to do and just creating these, these, you know, co-creation of projects and work together to make things happen is key. And I know that with time, things will get um, even better and better. Agreed. I think for the sake of time, maybe we should um, just wrap up now because I think so. The last question from Kim was, you know, as coffee educators, what barriers are you facing, and how can key industry players like SCA and CQI support? Um, I think that's an amazing question, but I do think you guys have kind of answered it already. It seems like a lot of support for co helping sponsor costs, um, so that the um, folks who are really passionate, like you too, Maria said and Nicole, you know 
you're not going out of pocket or that folks can access it a little bit more um, without having to pay? Maybe that's a really powerful answer. But I wonder if um, the panelists, it's up to you, if you would be interested in putting your email addresses into the chat in case folks like Kim, who I know um, maybe where um, that question is coming from, could potentially um, carry on a conversation if that's something that is of interest to anyone. I'm just putting it out there. If anyone maybe wanted to continue that conversation via email, I think you three are um, have really powerful perspectives that could make that question really productive um, and collaborations maybe with um, Kafia School or something like that. So panelists, maybe you decide if you want to continue the conversation that way, feel free to decide to put your email in the chat. But otherwise, I, I, I would like to say something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would like to say something to to Keen, that is a woman that I admire a lot. Um, I think that what people don't know is that all these classes for SEA and CQI and other organizations, they have people creating that, developing those classes for free. They are putting all their knowledge and all their experience and paying resources at Onore, okay? So these organizations are creating information for us. The only thing that we need to do is access the education and the programs that they have. But in order for them to keep updating the coffee, knowledge that they have, we need to pay the courses. So I don't think that anything for free is good. Venezuela is in a really bad position because thinking that we need things for free. We don't need anything for free. We need to work hard and we need to try to access the education in the way that we can. Mm -hmm. I know that that's probably controversial, but I don't think that things for free are good. And we have somebody recently, somebody in a group said, I don't recommend anybody to pay for courses. I got everything for free. And I that broke my heart because for many years, I didn't buy cookies for my daughter or the things that she wanted because I was saving to travel and to pay for a course that I thought that it was going to be helpful for me. So I don't think that education has to be free. I think that we can provide scholarships and all these organizations have that for some people if they meet the requirements and that's beautiful. So King, I think that you are doing a wonderful job. Keep doing that, keep researching, keep providing us the information that we need so we can be better. But things for free, I am not with that. That's my opinion. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm having trouble. I am, I'm having a little bit of trouble uh, to post in the chat. If you can oh, sure. share my, my uh, email address with yeah. everyone. I could do that. I will appreciate it. And also, there's another farm, uh, Finca San Pedrito. Uh, that's from a very good friend, Ale uh, Alejandra. Uh, I, I can also share the contact if, if you wish. Finca San Pedrito? Pedrito? Sí. And, and uh, her name is Alejandra Rodriguez. Okay. Um, yes, and I'll put your email in here too. And then I think, um, oops. We have um, had an amazing conversation with everybody. Um, and I really appreciate everybody staying through the, um, like through, since this is a little bit longer than we, we went over a little bit, but I think it's been so powerful. This is sort of the, um, I think the reason why um, I was really excited about having this conversation is because you three are so passionate, but it is a really big conversation that we really, I think, need to be having and continue having and so many different perspectives need to come together so that we can really unpack some of this because it's kind of big stuff. Um, okay, Nicole, I'm putting your email here. 
make sure I type it correct. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I think maybe we'll um, wrap us up if that's okay. Uh, maybe if we wanted to continue um, the conversation, we can have something on Instagram or, you know, folks can add comments or things like that um, or get in touch. But yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. Thank, thank you, you. you three amazing women. Thank you for sharing your time and experience and expertise with us and for everyone for attending on International Women's Day. Thank you so much for sharing your time with all of thank us. You. Thank you. Thank this you. This has been great. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You thank you. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Muchísimas gracias. gracias. Que les vayan bien. Gracias. Bye-bye. Have a good Bye, day. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye.